Welcome everybody. Welcome to our session, Democratic Education for the Underprivileged. I'm very happy that we have some guests today and I would like to pass on to Derry. He will introduce our guests and lead the first part of our session. Derry, please go ahead. Well, what a privilege. I've met Busto and Anna Iris several times, first of all in Devon in England, 2011, 10 years ago maybe, but then the most spectacular experience of visiting Puerto Rico. My own background, as you know, is partly from Ireland. Puerto Rico, the Isla Encantando, the Green Island, the Enchanted Island, it so reminded me of Ireland. And in so many ways, the relationship between Puerto Rico, Spain, and then with the United States also reminded me of the relationship between Ireland and England. I even got so excited about it, I wrote a little article for a newspaper, and it actually got published in Puerto Rico, talking about the Green Island. And it was a wonderful experience particularly the energy and the arts, the artistic talent emerging from the communities that Husto was working with. And I remember well the key idea that I remember from Husto. He says, our communities are capable of building the education they need in order to build the communities they need a benign spiral between community, education, energy, talent, and the rebuilding of community. And that he saw democratic education as a key part to this, democracy as a key word, the involvement of everyone in the community. In fact, Husto made a TED talk, I think, some time ago called Toda por mi Australia. Unfortunately, it seems to have disappeared from the internet. Yeah. I, I tried to watch it again and I couldn't find it. So perhaps he can tell us how to find it. But it's interesting today that John wants to explore the idea of individualism and community in the context of less privileged socio and economic environments. And this has always been of interest to me too, from the point of view of how do we open up the educational possibilities for poor working class kids in my country, and whether the democratic education movement as represented by wonderful schools like Sudbury Valley School or Summerhill School, but whether these schools really provide the most relevant possible model as they tend to be private, fee-paying, and themselves to represent privilege. So how do we break that circle of privilege repeating itself? So just once more, Husto's statement that sticks in my mind, our communities are capable of building the education they need in order to build the communities they need. Such a wonderful key idea. So I wonder if this point I can shut up. Always difficult to shut up, but I'll do my best and give the floor to Husto and Anna Iris and Brian and Kanani to talk a little bit about how they've come to be a part of this democratic education movement to tell us a little bit about themselves. So over to you, Puerto Rico. Thanks a lot for this invitation, for this opportunity of seeing friends from so many years ago. We're very happy to see Mike just recently in past IDEC and Dorotea. It's a privilege for us to share this space with you. Just a clarification point, Anaïris will be speaking in Spanish and I will be translating because she's Dominican and in Dominican Republic, English is not taught in schools. So. We exist very much in the context that Derry brings, 
we democratize the practice of Nuestra Escuela, but we cannot name Nuestra Escuela a democratic school because we live in, as Derry says, students create the education they need for the communities they need, but also for the nation that we aspire. Puerto Rico, it's a colony of the United States of America. And in the colonial situation, there is no democracy. So we cannot abstract from that reality and say that we live in a democratic bubble inside an undemocratic reality. So our students uh, really learn our community because it's not something that is taught to the student, it's practices that we develop in the community of Nuestra Escuela because we need to be like we want our students to be. So our community in Nuestra Escuela learns and practice democracy inside Nuestra Escuela and other scenarios in Puerto Rico in order to work for democratic communities and for a democratic nation, which requires decolonization and self-determination. That's the context. Nuestra Escuela was born 13 years ago, is going to be now in August, by an accident. We were not planning to create a school, and it's literally an accident, a car accident, in which one of my four daughters passed away. I got into a very deep depression. And one of the things that sustained myself during that period for almost two years, very depressed because of the death of my daughter, Ana Mercedes, was Ana Iris, my other daughters, and Ana Mercedes that came to my dreams. And in a dream, one night, she told me that we are going to create a school. I replied, Mercedes, not even there you quit inventing things. How are we going to create a school? And she said, yes, that we are going to create the school, Nuestra Escuela. Nuestra Escuela is named as such because she named it. And I said, but how? And she said, let yourself be guided. I talked to Ana Iris and Ana Iris said, look at me and said, you know how she is, let's do it. We went to my mother, public education teacher for all her professional life. And we told her we were bankrupt at that moment because I was just in my bed crying and reading, and Iris was taking care of me. Uh, so we went to my mother and told her the dream, and my mother just asked me to go for her purse and gave me all her money, $20, and said, go and create that school. And so we did. It's going to be 23 years now since everything began. But now we had to create a school. How do you do that? And what I knew about education was my life as a student that was combined of two parts. I was a nerd in school, but also I was a university student activist for the decolonization and self-determination of Puerto Rico. And in university, our struggle was for the co-governance of the Poly University of Puerto Rico, co-governance between teachers, workers, students, the whole community that surrounded the university. And also in the dream, and Mercedes presented to me that we were going to work with kids on underprivileged situation, kids that come from poverty level in Puerto Rico, Puerto Rico. 60% of the population lives under poverty level. And I just will give some more details about that. So we were going to work with kids out of school with co-governance. That's how we started. Why? Because that's what I struggled for in the university. So we recruited the first students that came. And, and I just had a conversation with them. What? took you out of school without finishing it 
In Puerto Rico, they call that the sectores escolares, school dropouts. We all understand that naming them as such is an act of bullying. We shouldn't put nicknames to people because of their disadvantages. And Anaïs says, what took you out of school and how is the school that you dream? And they said many reasons uh, why they move out from school. And we have Brian and Kanani here that can talk more about that. But they describe very clearly, very specifically, the school that they wanted. They wanted the school where they receive love and respect. The rest didn't matter. So we understood that it was going to be a school co-governed by the community in which we respect our students and eventually we learn all the members of the community and a school founded on love. That is what has been lacking to our underprivileged kids. It has been lacking in our colonial history, especially with our underprivileged kids. We started the school. It was very difficult at the beginning. In the first three, four years, 25 of our students were killed because we work with kids from the community, from the streets. And we started at 18 because we have always been very important for us not to undermine the public schools, to take students out of the public school of, of Puerto Rico, undermining the public education system of Puerto Rico that is a colonial system, but it's public. So we try to support and help in practices, the public education of Puerto Rico, not to undermine it. So we started at 18 and it was late for so many of our students. 25 were killed, it was chaotic, the beginning, until, and I just said, let's stop recruiting students. We had 30 at that time. Let's keep with those 30 and try to start a co-governance, a love and respect community with this small group. We did so, and step by step, we saw every student shifting the street culture to the love, respect culture in the community. Then we saw the initial staff made the shift also. And when all that liberation came from the inside of each member of the community, of the small community that we were in that moment, the most beautiful school erupted from that. From the liberation of each of our students, in that moment I understood that what I had learned in the student movement, that a free Puerto Rico with free Puerto Ricans was the other way around. A critical mass of free Puerto Ricans will free Puerto Rico. So we shifted to education that liberates yourself in community and form activists for democracy in Puerto Rico. Starting with yourself, with your family, with your community, and then with the nation. That was like the process. How the school is today, and I just will give us some numbers. Hola, estoy muy, muy feliz y agradecida. Very happy and grateful to be here. De la oportunidad de, de estar aquí, sobre todo de ver los rostros de personas que admiro y quiero mucho. Especially to see the faces that, of people that I really admire and love. Como, como Derry, como, como Doro, eh, como Mike. Like Derry, Doro, Mike, and then the rest. En términos de cómo es la escuela hoy, me gustaría presentarles un poco de las estadísticas. She will show some statistics of how it's the school today. Primero, eh, en el contexto de Puerto Rico, el 82% de la población vive bajo los niveles de pobreza. 
In Puerto Rico, 60% lives under poverty level. El 60% en Puerto Rico vive bajo los niveles de pobreza y en el caso de nuestra escuela, el 82%. 60% of Puerto Rico lives under poverty level. 82% of our students live under poverty level. Ese 18% restante eh, vive bajo eh, niveles de, de pobreza, solamente que no están reconocidos en el Estado porque la diferencia de los ingresos de nuestras familias oscila entre 3 y 7 mil dólares. The rest 18% that is supposedly not to live under poverty level is under United States statistics live with from $3,000 to $7,000 per year. En términos de la cantidad de, eh, quizás una premisa importante eh, que, que llamó mucho la atención nuestra eh, fue la cantidad de estudiantes que no viven con sus padres. One very impacting characteristic of our population It's the amount of them that doesn't live with their parents. Con los padres, específicamente. Especially with the father. El 88% de nuestros estudiantes no vive con sus padres. 88% of our students don't live with their father. Y el 23% no vive con su madre. 23% does not live with their mother. Viven con o las abuelas o las tías o algunos viven en hogares sustitutos. They live with grandmothers, which is a wrong column in Puerto Rico. Grandmothers, other relatives, and some in institution of the state. Actualmente, nuestra escuela cuenta con 393 estudiantes. Actually, although receiving funds for 200 students, Nuestra escuela has 397 students. So with every allocation of funds, we have two students. Sosteniendo un 94% de retención a través de los 23 años de servicio. We have achieved 94% retention along the 23 years. Esta cifra es sumamente relevante eh, si partimos de la premisa de que las y los jóvenes con quienes trabajamos en nuestra escuela han en algún momento abandonado la misma. Which is very important to us because these are kids that had previously moved out from school, but they have been able to remain in nuestra escuela. Con relación a el modelo de servicio que utilizamos en, en obviamente si tienen alguna pregunta con relación a las estadísticas eso lo podemos atender más adelante. Con relación a los elementos del modelo de servicio de nuestra escuela. In terms of the services model of nuestra escuela. Estamos hablando de eh, que tiene dos elementos que hemos anclado en cinco pilares. It's based in 12 elements and five pillars. This is something that has evolved through the years. It wasn't planned that way at the beginning of nuestra escuela. I first designed was kind of a traditional school with love and respect. But through the years, this model evolved. El taller Esencia Vital. The first one is the Esencia Vital, Vital Essence Retreat. Los círculos. Circles. We are not organized by classrooms. We are organized by circles, very in the Pablo Freire tradition education. El todo por mi estrella, que es un plan estratégico personalizado. The strategic personal plan of every member of the community, not of the students, of every member of the community, the strategic personal plan that we name all for my star. Educación personalizada y los emprendimientos. Personalized education, that is how we call our model. Personalized education that may have aspects of many other models like democratic education, like Montessori, like Reggio Emilia, and so on. But it's like a development of all of that together. 
And the last pillar, it's the skills of entrepreneurship in our community. Como hemos nombrado a nuestra escuela, es como una escuela amorosa. And how we name our school different to democratic or free or freedom or Montessori or Reyo, Emilia or Sotbury, for example, is a loving school. And then we have Brian. Hello, everybody. My name is Brian Sanchez. I'm a former student of Nuestra Escuela, former member of the board of directors of Nuestra Escuela, and always a proud student of Justo and Ana Iris. My experience in Nuestra Escuela started at 2006, I believe. I call that the trial and error stage of Nuestra Escuela because how Justo sets the model of Nuestra Escuela had changed since, but the essence started to show at that stage, the building of a community, the democratic and governance aspect of that institution started soon when I entered Nuestra Escuela. Something that I want to say is that I believe the elasticity of the Nuestra Escuela model is a pillar of its success because they are not married with any model. They bring what they believe works and what we believe as a community that works and we put it into practice. And if it doesn't work, we discard it. If it works, it stays. Something about the statistics that Anaidi just mentioned it. I am one of those students that neither had my mother or my father figure at my life. I am a proud grandson of my abuelita, my grandmother, and that's a reality in many, many of the students of Nuestra Escuela. You have elders taking care of children with little resources to do it, and Nuestra Escuela is a place where they can push that education that they need Something that I want to mention is that something that Justo says, it's very hard and very difficult to start a democratic model of education in a country that doesn't know how democracy works. That's why the trial and error thing is surrounding my mind, because we are learning democracy while implemented it. So it's difficult to be something that you don't know yet as a country. So that's my basic thought. I'm open to questions. If Pusto wants to add something or ask me something to guide me in this conversation. Yes, a little, Brian, about when your home family broke up and what happened to you in that moment. And from there, what you are doing today. Okay. In 2005, my mother and my father divorced it, and my mother got into a deep depression that take her to, took her life. After that, I started living the streets, and by a judicial decision, I ended up with my father, who I blame it to what happened to my mother. And through that time, I was out of the public school that I attended. So in that chaotic situation, I had to take a decision to what to do with my education. And a friend told me that he knew a school that was fantastic because they don't use uniforms and they had a pool table in the middle of the school. And that was <laughs> just what I needed <laughs> to... to go and see what kind of school that was. So I went to Nuestra Escuela in a chaotic day. I saw a lot of people with bags and, and dressed up like they are ready to take a travel or something. And I saw a little guy with beard and a hat wearing <laughs> flip-flops. <laughs> and for some reason, my father says, I need to talk to that guy. He went with Justo and told Justo about what happened to me. And from 1,200 waiting list, Justo decided to accept me at the school and told me that day 
go back to your house, take your clothes, because you are going to the retreat, to a vital essence retreat, to the forest of Puerto Rico. Since then, I have been with Nuestra Escuela uh, after, I don't know, uh, 15, 16 years, I'm still here. And something that I want to say is that even uh, you don't pay a fee to be at Nuestra Escuela, I believe that with the culture that Nuestra Escuela developed in their communities, we, we feel that we need to pay not with money, but with effort and with uh, showing the values that we learned, we were taught at Nuestra Escuela every single day. And you have many, many, many of former students going places with the Nuestra Escuela flag with them. Currently, I am a law student at the south of Puerto Rico, and I am very proud to say that everywhere I go, I am a product of Nuestra Escuela. Thank you, Brian. Uh, Canani? Just before Brian goes, Justo, I wonder if I could throw in a comment here. Am I right in thinking that 80% of the population of Puerto Rico have Spanish as the first language, and the public school system teaches the curriculum in Spanish, whereas the private schools, which about 20% of kids go to, on the whole, teach the curriculum in English, and English is required for the more elite professional jobs, like the law or the civil service or the police need English. So 80% of the kids are immediately shut out of some of the major opportunities in the life of Puerto Rico. And before Brian goes, I have to say, his English is very, very good, better than mine. Um, <laughs> did he speak such good English when he first went to Nuestra Escuela? Or has Nuestra Escuela equipped him, facilitated him with English at the level where he can cope with anything that crops up, any opportunity that emerges in Puerto Rico? You're absolutely right, Derry. And one way of oppression in Puerto Rico is the language, the language barrier. Because as numbers are, as you said, and in general, 85% of our population in Puerto Rico do not speak English, although we are taught 12 years of English in school, public school, and at least two in the university level. So although many of our people have 14 years receiving English classes, one class and all the rest in Spanish, there is a resistance in maybe, I don't know, in our DNA, because we are Spanish-speaking country and English was imposed to us since the U.S. invasion in 1898 until 1930s. It was imposed. Spanish was forbidden. The Puerto Rican flag was forbidden in Puerto Rico, and that created such a resistance that people really don't appreciate it and don't relate to it. So it's a skill of the privilege in Puerto Rico. And so Nuestra Escuela, in that sense of democratizing the opportunities, we are in our political position. We understand that managing English, it's very important in Puerto Rico, but about Brian's development in English, Brian? I learned English by myself with the great influence of what I did with Nuestra Escuela, not just as a student, but the international opportunities that I had with Justo and Nana Edis. And basically, even when I was taught English for 12 years, it wasn't enough. It was a skill that I developed by myself and with other opportunities because it's not taught as a tool, but as an oppression mechanism in Puerto Rico. So it's, it's, but that's another discussion, but that, that's my experience. Thank you. Sorry to interrupt. Kanani. Hi, so my name is Kanani Santiago Fontanes. I'm 17 years old, and I've been in Nuestra Escuela for about two years now. It was 
a roller coaster before I went to Nuestra Escuela, considering that I was a dropout. Like I didn't go to school for a whole semester. And I was able to know about Nuestra Escuela thanks to my sister who had a horrible experience in the public system school. And I was afraid of losing her. My whole family was afraid of losing her. And when she went to Nuestra Escuela, she was able to like finish 12th grade. And that was actually something that impressed us. Like me and my family were impressed by that because she had a horrible fear, like a big, big fear of studying, you know, like thanks to that bad experience that she had in the public school she was in. So when I came here, I always had in my mind that I had to be this and I had to look like this to be able to be in a school and like just like be accepted in a school. Here in Entre Escuela, I was heard, I was listened, uh, my opinion was valid, and I feel like it's the only place where I fully felt accepted uh, by who I am and what I want to be. Again, as Brian said, if Justo has like any question to guide me, that would be great. ¿Podrías, por favor, hablar un poquito de tu experiencia y tu rol como, como miembro del Consejo Estudiantil? Can she talk a little about her experience in nuestra escuela and her role as a student leader? Okay, so I belong to the school counseling, the student school counseling, and um, it's actually amazing, like, how much a student's voice can be heard in nuestra escuela. Like, it's, it's fascinating, considering that we're the ones that are going to be there, like, studying every day, taking this class, taking that class, and, like, our voices are completely heard. Like, it's to the point where we, like, we know about everything that's going on with the school, like, literally everything about the, the system that we work with, the, I don't know, like, who we, who are our teachers, who are going to be our teachers, who we who we hire and fire, which is something amazing, considering that we are the ones that are going to be there with the, with the teacher and with the social workers and such. And in normal, like in public schools, like traditional public schools, um, we do not have that vote and that like our voices are not heard. Like we can literally have a teacher who treat us horribly and we cannot do anything about it. But in nuestra escuela, we need to go through that experience so the teacher can be or not be in, like, in the school. Uh, we know everything about the budget, and it's something that we work with. Uh, like The school admin and the students work hand-to-hand -hand with it, and we know everything about it. We know how every single cent is used in the school. That's amazing. The idea of participatory budgeting is beginning to catch on as a way of fully involving students in the democratic running of schools in a few places. Can, Annie, can I just say that everything I said about Brian's quality of English absolutely applies to you <laughs> as well? And so I wonder if just be, be fair to the public school teachers in Puerto Rico, when we had the IDEC in Caguas, the president of the Public School Teachers Union came to the conference. Now, that in itself is extraordinary. It doesn't happen in most countries where we have an IDEC. The president of the Teachers Union, the Public School Teachers Union, came to the conference and was extremely interested in the ideas. In fact, Yakov Hecht and I gave talks and I think she circulated copies of our talks to many of the teachers. So that was a really a positive memory. But it's lovely to hear your English, Kanani. I wonder if before we move on to John, could I ask Kanani, where did you learn to speak English so fluently? That's a funny story because I never like learned English. I guess I just like, since I was a kid, like a baby, I guess I learned English at the same time I learned Spanish through like TV and like the things I watch and read. Okay, thank you. Anyway, it was a pleasure listening to you. 
I think at this point we're running a bit behind. We always do. Who cares? But now it's time to pass over to John, who has prepared quite a list of questions for the group from Puerto Rico that now become our panel, who exposed to the full rigor of John Laughlin's questions. John, are you ready to go? And Puerto Rico, are you ready to be blasted with John's questions? <laughs> Absolutely. Looking forward to it. Okay, John, over to you. Uh, thanks, uh, Derry. Uh, uh, first thing I want to say is congratulations to Usto and the school. Uh, I consider you and the and the students and the teachers homeboys and homegirls to me. I'm speaking in, I mean, I mean this, you're, you're homies, uh, uh, you're, you're revolutionaries, your fellow revolutionaries. So uh, that's important because it looks like to me your school has a political purpose. I'm not sure if a democratic school in Germany, in Berlin, has a political purpose. It does, but it's hidden because schools are political sites and going to school is a political act, especially if you're in a colonized situation. But that's just a comment. Again, congratulations. And, and, and just John, to comment to that, in US Escuela, we do not have a partisan position, but as we do popular education, that is definitely a political process. Also, when you say, this school does not get involved in politics. That is a political position. Well, you may not get involved in politics, but going to school by children, no matter what, from my perspective, is a political act, especially if you're Absolutely. a minority. Learning how to read is a political act for some children in America because it's an existential act. You could be in real trouble if you can't read. It's almost a survival tactic. But what I'd like to ask, though, to help people understand this, uh, do you consider yourself and honor people of color? We are people of color in the broad definition. In Puerto Rico, we are mixed. And we don't segregate ourselves by the color of our skin, although there is prejudice against the the evident black people, which means that their skin is black, not only their history, their culture, but we are the mix of many cultures. We are descendants of our Indians, Taino Indians, the black slave people that came to Puerto Rico, and the people from the south of Spain that did the colonization that really were more Arabs than Spanish than white people, because it's people from Andalusia who came to colonize here. And after 800 years of Arab ruling over Spain, and as Hispanics, if for example, in the US culture, we are definitely, although Canaanis skin is white, and we are more dark, and it is and me, and Brian is in the middle, we are people of color, definitely. The reason I ask that is that within the democratic education theory group, there doesn't seem to be a lot of democratic schools started and administered by people of color. There's democratic schools started by mainly Europeans where people of color may attend, but there are very few that are started and run as your school is. So that's why I'm asking that question when I use that term people of color. So what did Usko, Usko in particular, what did your parents do? Tell us about your parents a little bit. Well, I always say that I was born in a classroom because my father and my mother were teachers, public school teachers. So instead of gifts in Christmas, they gave me books, which I now appreciate, not in that moment, but now I appreciate a lot. But they were public school teachers, low middle class, I was born in one of the poorest communities of Puerto Rico. 
And with hard work, my parents did some moving from that level, but we are low middle class in Puerto Rico and always in the education sector. That's why I was not going to be a teacher when I went to the university. I didn't know what I wanted to be. I know what I didn't want to be, a teacher. But life happened the other way. <laughs> OK, uh, it's interesting. I, I didn't know that. Uh, I learned a lot about your school, and it answered a lot of questions, Derry and everybody, that I had for Usto and his, his friends and, and coworkers. So he answered a lot of the questions. Right now, in particular, democratic education is pushing what is called student-centered, child-centered learning. It looks to me that your school also has what's called community-centered learning. Is your school more community-centered than student-centered learning? Por la naturaleza de, de los estudiantes y los estudiantes de nuestra escuela, las y los estudiantes son la prioridad. Sin embargo, nuestros estudiantes obviamente son parte de una comunidad. Our students are our priority uh, because of the background uh, that, that we have, but it's the community, the main priority. Y dentro de el trabajo que hacemos en la comunidad, eh, las decisiones se toman en colectivo. Tenemos, Decisions are taken collectively. Tenemos eh, consejos estudiantiles que nos reunimos una o dos veces cada mes. By the student body that meets one or twice a month. Y las asambleas estudiantiles que ocurren cuatro veces al año. And students assemblies that happen four times a year. And one thing that is very important is in Nuestra Escuela, it's a project-based learning. It's the circles in which we organize are thematic circles. For example, we can have an agriculture circle, theater circle, health circle. This happens with Nuestra Escuela and Nuestra Escuelita because since several years ago, we also have a preschool, elementary school, middle and high school. And also in the night, we have a community for the parents, a school for the community. And students gather around their theme, their thematic circle. For example, it's going to be mechanics. And then they decide, each student proposes one project. And they vote. And the project that is supported by the majority, the semester is going to be about creating that project but taking into consideration the projects that were not most supported should be integrated in the project. So it's decided by the student in a circle. Otro aspecto que me parece importante destacar en términos de, de si la escuela está centrada en la comunidad es que uno de de los paradigmas más importantes en, en la escuela es que vamos a trabajar para el bienestar común. Incluye a cada miembro de la comunidad, eh, personal que trabaja en nuestra escuela, las familias y las y los estudiantes. A main criteria that guides nuestra escuela is the common well-being. So that has to be built in community. In each person, it gets integrated into that. Una manera de entenderlo es, por ejemplo, eh, en los servicios de alimentos. Usualmente en las escuelas los servicios de alimentos son solamente para eh, las y los estudiantes. En el caso de nuestra escuela es para toda la comunidad. School food that is cooked and distributed every day in our public and private education in Puerto Rico, it's only for students. In nuestra escuela it's for everybody, including the community that surrounds the school. The internet the research says that Europe, the United States, and Australia are the most individualistic countries on the planet, very individualistic. And what I'm trying to get at here is the question of student-centered versus community-centered. And it, it's also come up more than once in regard to learning how to read. In some free schools, Sudbury Model Schools, in fact, Summer Hill Schools, the student learns how to read when they're ready. To others, I've read that that would be a detriment to black children or 
poor Puerto Rican children to allow them to learn to read when they're ready or when they want to, because it's an act of survival. My question is, how do you balance what the student wants to do with what your community needs? Because the schools in Europe that are democratic, they don't have a community. Us white people, we don't really have a community like you do. We're more individualistic and we're proud of that fact that we can be ourselves and not do what the community wants us to do. Back to my question, how child-centered versus community-centered, how do you deal with that problem? And what do you think about allowing students to learn how to read when they're ready? First of all, that person or group that wrote that in the internet didn't come to Puerto Rico because Puerto Rico is not an individualistic country or people is not like US or white Australia because Australia is many things. Someone very dear to us, Mr. Derry Hannam, wrote an article that said it takes a lunatic to understand that Puerto Rico is the United States. We are, on the contrary, not individualistic about operating in the individual sense or in community sense. I would like Brian or Kanani to comment if it is individualistic or, or it is community-based and about the importance of learning to read, Brian. I wasn't part of Nuestra Escuelita. My early development at school was in the public school. I learned to read when I was supposed to learn to read by the standards of public education. And I see that that's something, as you said, that is needed by a person who is expected to know something in order to go to the next step. So in that regard, I actually think like you in, in that regard. In the other part, in Puerto Rico, we are as family and as communities, non-individualistic at all. So of course we have some traits from the relationship that we have with the United States and the influence and everything, but every day we live in communities and we depend of that kind of relationship in order to survive in our, uh, in our environment. So it's something that comes natural from us to, to be connected as a community. En el caso de, de nuestra escuelita, me gustaría profundizar un poquito en el proceso. Y es que nuestras y nuestros niños eh, escogen el tema sobre el cual quieren aprender. In the case of our pre and elementary school, kids choose the theme about what they want to learn in an assembly. Pero estamos muy conscientes porque lo hemos vivido que cuando un, un niño no aprende a leer antes de tercer grado, eh, se complica el proceso de aprendizaje. But we understand that if a kid doesn't learn how to read before third grade, the rest of his education will be more complicated. Y tiene muchísimo que ver con que en la manera en la que está estructurada el proceso educativo, no, no necesariamente en nuestra escuela, eh, no hay tiempo para detenerse con un niño a enseñarle a leer. In our general education system, lack of time, difficult teaching one specific kid how to read if it's having difficulty. Así que la manera en que lo hacemos es inspirando a las y los niños con libros vinculados específicamente a su tema de interés. So how we do it is to inspire kids with books totally related to the theme that they in an assembly selected to study during the semester. The books will be about their interest. Lo otro que hacemos es que creamos espacios muy acogedores dentro de la escuela, dentro del mismo salón, solo para entrar a leer. So there are beautiful places inside the building and we have two sites in Puerto Rico, one in Caguas and one in Loiza. Loiza is where we have the majority of our Afro Boricua population. And we create beautiful spaces just to go there to read. 
por ejemplo, tenemos una casita de madera dentro del de salón, anclada a una de las columnas. There is a wood house in the classroom. Inside the classroom. Y, los, y, y ese espacio es para ir a leer. And that space that they love is to go there to read. My question comes around again about the nature, the political nature of your school. In some Sudbury Valley and Summerhill and European schools, to get the students to go out and solve social problems is considered an imposition on children. I know in your school, you may say, today we have to go out and march in protest due to some issue. But in some schools in Europe, that would be considered to be an imposition on children. You have to be free and let the children do what they want. But I don't see your school taking on that philosophy. Is that true or not true? Brian, ¿podrías comentar sobre el activismo político que se desarrolla en Canadá? ¿Podrías comentar? Can, can you please comment, oh, Brian, on Canadá, on the political activism inside the school? <laughs> Is it imposed mean... or how it happens? No, it's not imposed. In nuestra escuela, they show us the perspectives of what's happening in the country and let us decide. We usually decide to go to march or to protest because we fully understand what is happening in Puerto Rico, but it's not required for us to do so. So it's a decision, an informed decision, a community decision, and we usually are the ones that, we usually not, we, we are the ones that take that decision in order to protect what we believe is right. I'm not saying there's anything the matter with the European style of letting children do what they want. It's just that I think the Europeans think that this is the way all children should be raised. It's more of a libertarian point of view. It's more of a let the child do what they want. But that philosophy that may not work for some schools, and I just want that to be Considered, and we'll talk about this chart because this chart says basically that the Europeans are more oriented towards objects and the non Europeans are more oriented towards people. Would you agree or disagree with? Me? Absolutely. There are symbols, for example, in the United States, it celebrated the Workers' Day on the first Monday of September, and it's just a free day. On that day, we operate as normal, as usual. Workers' Day, we celebrate the 1st of May as the rest of the world. And then we teach about why we have a holiday on the 1st of May, and we teach about that. And there is demonstrations in Puerto Rico, and then the group decide, and they can ask their teacher, can we go to a demonstration? And then the school supports that but doesn't call to go and do this, but teaches about that. And if students uh, would like to do it, then school supports. Yeah, we see here that the dominant American culture, which is European, the same thing, are more oriented towards objects and the non-dominant culture towards people. Let's go down here to the concepts of intelligence. To the Europeans, an intelligent child is someone who is aggressive and competitive. But to the non-dominant culture, a child is intelligence who knows how to complete chores. What's your opinion of that dichotomy? Creo que un aspecto en el, que, en el cual sí hacemos un énfasis importante en nuestra escuela. We do an important emphasis in nuestra escuela. Es en la colaboración en lugar de la competencia. It's in collaboration instead of competition. Incluso cuando hacemos juegos, garantizamos que sean juegos colaborativos donde ningún estudiante va a perder. In our sports, inside the school, it's always collaborative sports, not competition sports, where a student may lose. We do collaborative sports in which everybody will win. 
y, y ese aspecto eh, da un sentido de comunidad que no solamente se traduce en el trabajo que hacemos en la escuela, sino también a sus familias. That creates a sense of community that then will percolate to their families and communities and eventually to Puerto Rico. Not competing between us, collaborating among us. Yes, I understand that. And again, I'm not saying that the dominant European is wrong. It's just that I think a lot of the democratic education theory people see the world from that point of view and think that should be universalized. When in fact, for some communities, it's an act of survival that you have to collaborate, not compete. I got another question here in that same thing in regard to culture and youth culture. And I can ask you two students, does Escuela endorse hip hop and reggaeton? Ganani, hip hop and reggaeton in la escuela. Nuestra escuela is very like liberating. Like I feel like we're not judged by what we do, like what we listen, I guess. Like it's to the point where let's say Anaís or Justo, like even though they don't necessarily like it, they just like go with it. Just so our students feel comfortable in their environment. For example, really don't like Bad Bunny, but I have to accept that it's an idol, a Puerto Rican idol to our students. So I go with it. A few more questions here. What is a personal strategic plan? Students have personal strategic plans. What does that mean? Uh, Anais will explain and ask Kanani to talk about all from a start. En nuestra escuela hacemos, tenemos un plan estratégico personalizado para cada uno de, los, de nuestros estudiantes. We have a personal strategic plan for each student and for each member of the community. Se trata de responder dos preguntas en cinco aspectos. It's answering two questions in five subjects. ¿Quién soy? Who am I? A nivel social. In social terms. Emocional. In emotional terms. Intelectual. Intellectual terms. Espiritual. Spiritual terms. Y físico. And physical terms. Who am I? Y ese proceso se completa cuando nuestras y nuestros estudiantes llegan a la escuela. When youth comes to nuestra escuela, interested in becoming students, they first go to the retreat. In the retreat, they become students. And then answering this question is the next thing they do. Then the second question is, who I want to be? En los mismos aspectos. In the same five aspects. Who am I in those five aspects? Who I want to be in those five aspects? And we always clear, it's not, what do you want to be? In terms of if you want to be a plumber or mechanic or lawyer, not so what you want to be is who you want to be. Y la escuela se convierte en el apoyo desde quién soy hasta quién quiero ser. And nuestra escuela becomes the support to move from who I am to who I want to be. And that path is the personal study plan. Y lo que hace que la educación sea personalizada. And that personalizes education because that orients what the student will study in nuestra escuela depending on his or her strategic personal plan. Well, you have, I see, a entrepreneurship of family, community, and country plan. What's that? Para el programa de emprendimientos, bueno, eh, la escuela lo aplica en dos etapas. We do entrepreneurship in two stages. La primera es que nuestros estudiantes trabajan desde los círculos educación basada en proyectos. It's project-based learning. Y nos aseguramos de que cada estudiante aprenda eh, destrezas de emprendimiento. Each student must learn entrepreneurship skills. Uh, que pueden ser eh, un emprendimiento social, atender un problema de la comunidad. It can be a social entrepreneurship dealing with a community problem. O hacer dinero or economic entrepreneurship to make some money. Or 
híbrido que puede ser hacer dinero para atender un problema social que necesita una inversión. O hybrid en términos de entrepreneurship económico que beneficie una situación de comunidad. Y ese es el primer aspecto. El segundo that, that was aspecto. El segundo es el aspecto. El segundo es que ahí en el primero nuestros estudiantes aprenden a, a manejar el tema de los emprendimientos, cómo hacer un emprendimiento y cómo ganar dinero. Once they develop those skills. Y en el segundo, eh, trabajamos con egresados y egresadas de nuestra escuela que quieran montar un negocio. Then with these entrepreneurship skills, graduates who want to create entrepreneurship is supported by nuestra escuela. Y eso va desde acompañar un proceso de capacitación profesionalizada. Including counseling on professional economic development. Un plan de negocios. A business plan. Eh, asesoría de abogados para incorporar la organización. Lawyers support in how to create your organization. Y una presentación ante inversionistas que quieran apoyar su, su desarrollo económico. And a presentation in front of people who could support economically your project. And all this because we are traditionally in a culture of becoming employees in a market where there are no employments. So we cannot do everything that nuestra escuela does for all the years that a student will be there and end in nothing because there is not an employment that you can get. Plus, our employment market is usually very colonized. So developing entrepreneurship skills also teaches you in collective and community how to entrepreneur to create the nation. All right, I have one more question. Thank you so far. I want to point out that what is happening here is that Henning and Derry has helped us bring class, social class into the conversation in the democratic education movement. I know it one to, was concerned about gender and ability and politics and age, but class, social class was always underneath that because from my perspective, The democratic education movement was a white European middle class concept. You're showing that's not the case. But my question is to both of you, does IDEC have a diversity and inclusion problem? We went to IDEC, uh, it, it was like five years that we couldn't go to IDEC. It will very, very depend on the national context. We have been in, in very white people with another economic situation, IDEX. We have been in the Puerto Rico IDEX that was with our community. In the Nifinan IDEX, the Maori culture was very, very present. This last one in Summerhill, we felt there like a minority. In the Puerto Rico delegation and the Jamaica, friend that was there, she is really from Trinidad Tobago, we felt more like a minority to one idea. In Finland, we brought Kennedy Omondi Oronjo from our school in Kenya, in Kenya, in, in Africa. I don't know if you know that we have a school name, Chule Yetu, which means Nuestra Escuela in Swahili, in Kenya. We brought Kennedy to Finland And he felt like a fly in a glass of milk. <laughs> and, and he said this so, <laughs> you see? And he hasn't been again. Now we are moving to a conference, international education conference in Ghana. And from there, we will bring the people of Kenya. And first reply of Kennedy said, yes, in Ghana, I will feel more comfortable. But... It can be more inclusive. It can be more inclusive. I remember the girls from Trinidad Tobago questioned a lot in this past IDEC about the sense of inclusion, of non-inclusion that she was feeling, the aspect of language and so on. Could be, could be more inclusive. And in my case, for example, I would like to add that it's very important the inclusion uh, related to language. 
because people who are not fluent in English uh, be forced to speak with the words that we know, not exactly with the words with our heart. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, my, I'm saluting both you and, and the student, uh, Kanandi, and thank you for your time. Okay, John. I, well, thank you, because I think out of those uh, exchanges came an awful lot of information and raised an awful lot of questions. We're moving towards the Q&A session now. I just raised my head because I want to put a question. Yeah. Um, we're coming to the questions next, Mike, and yours is the first hand up, but we'll yes. just... We'll just give uh, Husto a couple of seconds. If we go back to the Taino culture before the Spanish culture, I get that I got the feeling that some of that is still alive in the spirit of Puerto Rico in the same way that Irish is still alive in England, even though in Ireland, even though the language has almost disappeared. Part of the spirit of the place comes from the ancient language and the ancient culture. But never mind that. Um, it was true at one time that Puerto Rican young people, uh, especially from the English-speaking community, would go to the northeast of the United States, to the East Coast universities, go to Harvard or something, trained to be lawyers and never come back to Puerto Rico. Whereas one of the things that sticks in my mind from coming to visit you a few years ago was that some young people, yes, they were going to the East Coast universities, but they were coming back to Puerto Rico. And it raises the whole question of independence because in Ireland, when I was a kid, there used to be signs in the windows of cheap hotels in Liverpool that said, no blacks, no Irish, and no dogs. And at that time, the Irish were a poor people and the standard of living in Ireland was very low. It was regarded as a place of poverty. It's no longer the case. The quality of living now in Ireland is higher it's a richer country than the United Kingdom per capita. And I'm just wondering about the connection between independence and beginning to solve the problems of the country. But that's perhaps another discussion. We could talk about independence another time. I'm only, I'm only talking to prevent Mike from asking his question. So Mike, I think the time has come for you to ask your question. Over to you. Okay, thank you. I'm a big fan of John because he brings up always critical questions to our whole discussions about democratic schools and how they work and how they function. But what I missed today is another aspect which didn't come up so far. And this is about the cultural background of the families of the daily life in distinct cultures. The first occasion when it came up to my attention was when we talked to people in Israel, when we visited Hadera school. And there was a man who said, I'm missing the Palestinian people. And that was not about power and money, I think, maybe too the community what John was talking about, but I think it was about the style of how a family works, that there is a father kind of patriarchy and there are many children and they all have to kind of subordinate within this family. And so this individualistic approach to be self-determined and a individualistic person that is, they are not very much appreciated. Another person, Youssef from Morocco, we met several times in our uh, discussions here. He agreed to this fact or to this situation in other cultures. And that is what I would like to ask you, if this is the case or if anybody in the room here 
is able to contribute to this question because this would be a real serious disadvantage of democratic schools if they weren't able to adapt to these different ways of culture in these communities, maybe out of religious background or anything else. That's my question, thank you. Could we put it to the Puerto Rican panel first and then open it up for anyone else who'd like to comment? Gusto, would you start? We were having a connection problem. Mike, can you say in just one sentence because we didn't were able to get you, we were not listening. Very short, it is about the issue if people or children from families with another cultural background are allowed or able to join into democratic schools, which are based on an individualistic way of functioning, like in Palestine and in Morocco, families are structured differently. And how is it possible to bridge that? We don't have that type of realities in, in Puerto Rico. We had for a long time prejudice against people from Dominican Republic in Puerto Rico. We consider ourselves superior to Dominicans in Puerto Rico. And Nuestra Escuela was founded by a Puerto Rican and a Dominican. Majority of our students are from Puerto Rico, but we have some a few from other countries. And we don't have that type of difficulty in Puerto Rico. Now, the prejudice against Dominicans have been overcome because Dominican Republic is developing more than Puerto Rico. And we have Puerto Ricans moving to Dominican Republic now. So we don't have that, but we are definitely open to all the people that want to be part of Nuestra Escuela, but with all the limited spaces that we have in the school. We have people from Venezuela, and Iris tells me, but although we have two students for every one that we have funds for, I still have a waiting list. Yes, but one short remark. It is not about being open to people of these families, but it's about these families who are not interested in joining these schools because they have another attitude to structuring their family life and their life in general. That is my question. I have an answer to not, that. Uh, it's not a reality in, in, in Puerto Rico. We are in that sense very Caribbean and, and relate very well among all. John. Mike, that's an important question, because now our evolution of our conversation has gotten to that question. I had to face that question myself a few years ago, and I think the answer is that you may have a situation where the family is collectivist and hierarchical, but they live in a democratic society. So the child comes home where grandpa decides everything, but he goes out into a culture where he has an equal vote with everybody. And even grandpa, when he votes, he's equal to everyone. So you can attract the family to a school that's going to help that child cope with the wider society outside the home, which is democratic, and help the family realize that, yes, Grandpa decides what goes on at home, but in the larger society, both grandpa and the child have to understand the democratic process. There is an English-speaking Sudbury model democratic school in the process of starting up in San Juan, I think, Gusto. And it would be interesting to see if any of the client group of Nuestra Escuela choose to go to this Sudbury type school in San Juan. And also I have a question. Do you have any of the English speaking community coming to the Nuestra Escuela schools? Well, a, a situation is that in Nuestra Escuela, students don't pay tuition. Uh, it's free for the students. And in Sudbury schools, Montessori schools, and so on, the family have to pay. 
uh -huh. and that limits the possible participation of our students in those other schools. So that doesn't happen. But for example, there is a Montessori very important school that sometimes they cannot deal with a kid. They don't get used to the system or so on. And we have received students from them transferred to Nuestra Escuela. And we have that type of relation. But as our students don't pay, then they cannot pay in these others. And we have had a lot of native English speakers, mainly from our diaspora. Youth that moves from the United States, from the diaspora to Puerto Rico, have English as their first language, and they have a lot of difficulties. El Canani puede desarrollar sobre esa, esa experiencia que está diciendo. So I remember, if I'm not wrong, back in like 2021, I clearly remember that there was a certain native English speaker uh, student in Loisa. If I'm not wrong, she was of African-American descent. She was mm -hmm. like sharing her experience on how she learned a lot about like the culture, like the Puerto Rican culture, even though that she wasn't quote unquote Puerto Rican. And she was completely accepted and everybody gave their best of efforts so she could feel comfortable within the school, even though that Nuestra Escuela is mostly Spanish speaking school. That's amazing, Kanani. Thank you so much. Really very interesting comment. Thank you. Henning first and then Karen. I'm very much interested in the question of funding your school. How do you fund your school? if it's possible that the students can attend the school without having to pay tuition. Yo quiero, quisiera hacer un comentario con relación a, a el hecho de que nuestros estudiantes no tengan que pagar. One comment related to uh, our students not paying money. Y es que, eh, bueno, lo voy a decir como lo siento. As I feel it. Mi esposo es un genio. Ah, she says that I am a genius. Y hizo que en Puerto Rico se pasara una ley. We worked on a bill of law. Y esa ley eh, se aprobó para garantizar que estudiantes that, que estuvieran fuera de la escuela. That law was approved to guarantee the youth out of school pudieran recibir, eh, pudieran asistir a escuelas de educación alternativa sin, sin tener que pagar. Could go to alternative education schools without having to pay. How we dealt with that, and it took us six years to pass that law in the legislature in Puerto Rico and to be signed by the governor, is that we use not the right to an education, but at, it is established in the human rights chart from the United Nations that says that what we have is a right to an education that provides for the full development of our personality. And when the Constitution of Puerto Rico was written, it repeated that human right an education, the right to an education that provides for the full development of your personality. So we took to the state that homogeneous education violates the human right and the Puerto Rico constitutional right. That youth, although they move out of school, they don't lose the right to education, but to an education that provides for the full development of their personality. So what really, provides for the human right and the constitutional right is alternative education. The fulfillment of as such, as much as uh, different personalities that we may have uh, before suing the government for violating the human and the constitutional right, after six years of work, they approved that law. And from that law comes the funds for Nuestra Escuela and five other organizations, something like 15 campuses around Puerto Rico. That provides for 50% of uh, Nuestra Escuela funds. El restante de los fondos proviene de fundaciones en Puerto Rico y de agencias gubernamentales 
eh, que recibimos fondos, por ejemplo, para trabajar con situaciones de violencia. Then the rest of the funds come from different proposals to foundations and government agency for specific things like domestic violence, problemas con la justicia, eh, youth having problems with the law system, y, y desarrollo de emprendimientos. And for entrepreneurship development. So it's 50% comes from the law that we were able to pass and 50% from proposals. And Anaïris and, and a team keeps working on uh, getting to funds so that we can guarantee the best quality liberating education to the underprivileged. The budget today is $5 million per year. Para las dos escuelas en Puerto Rico y el apoyo económico. For the two schools in Puerto Rico and the one in Kenya. Queriendo decir dos escuelas elementales, dos escuelas intermedia y superior, una escuela nocturna y el proyecto en Kenya. Two elementary schools, two high school, two schools for the community and the school in Kenya. It was very interesting. When we came to Puerto Rico, Justo and Ana is that the Banco Popular, one of the biggest banks in Puerto Rico, was actually supporting Nuestra Escuela. And the children of the president of the bank were actually working as volunteers, I think, with Nuestra Escuela. It's hard to imagine something like that happening in my country. But Karen's been waiting patiently and now also Candy. Karen, please. Thank you. So, Henny asked my first question. I'll go straight to the second. I would like to know how is Encuentro de Nuestra America going, the gathering of Americas? Well, uh, when we asked to host IDEC in 2012, our brothers from United States say no way because it already happened in United States. So that's where it came to see if Puerto Rico is United States or not. And that where Derry's essay was key to being able to have IDEC in Puerto Rico. Then we said, but Puerto Rico is Latin America. Then our brothers from the United States said, yes, but there is no Latin America movement on democratic education. So we committed to bring people from Latin America to our island. And we were able to bring people from 19 countries of Latin America to island in Puerto Rico. And we celebrated the first gathering of the Americas and the Caribbean. That decided that day, that was the last day of island, decided to keep doing this as Encuentro de Nuestra America, our America gathering that has happened in 2013 in Bolivia, 2015 in El Salvador, 2017, in Brazil, 2019, in Chile, then came COVID. So now, on the last 23, 24, and 25 of March, in next week, we will have a regional gathering of Central America and the Caribbean in Medellin, Colombia. And in autumn, we will have the sixth gathering of our America, Encuentro Nuestra America, in Argentina. So it has kept going on and developed really well. And now Encuentro Nuestra America exists for the decolonization, transformation, and emancipation of our people, the nuestros pueblos, not countries, but peoples recognizing our Afro people, our native people, our white people, our Caribbean, Brazilian, all of our peoples. We work for the decolonization Transformation of Emancipation. That's what Encuentro de Nuestra America, inspired in Nuestra Escuela, uh, is doing. Karen, and you are completely welcome to come. To Colombia. Oh, I would love to. How exciting. Candy, shall we bring you in here? Candy? I just wanted to mention my little section of the world, which is Appalachia. Because we bring in students from other places, we have students of all colors here, but in terms of Appalachia, it's pretty much white. But there's something that passed the legislature in the 
last year that's called the Hope Scholarship. And what it amounted to was if parents wanted to put their child in a different school, they could receive the basically more than we charge for tuition to go there. So we were very excited that that the state would be paying for this Hope Scholarship directly to parents and then parents could take it to a school, any school. Then we found out that in order to use that scholarship, you have to be in a public traditional school and apply to use it. You can't apply to use it unless if you're homeschooled, for example, you can't apply to use it if you're in a school like ours. You have to be in a traditional public school in order to get the funding to transfer your child to a school, a democratic school. So we'll keep working with the legislature about that, but at least we're getting a little bit closer perhaps to a time when it's not a matter of paying fees, even though in our school, we've always had very low fees, but still it would be wonderful not to have to have fees be an issue at all. Well, the possibilities appeared on the map. Let's hope you can push the door open, Candy. That would be wonderful. And that would be a wonderful example to some other parts of the world as well. We're coming up to closing time. We've got four minutes of our time left. So I think I should hand back to Henning. But just before I do, I'd like to thank Henning, also John, but especially Henning, for the work that he's done in enabling this session to happen, because I think we'll all agree that despite some problems with the internet, it's been a truly inspiring and information and encouragement sharing session. Absolutely wonderful. So from me, thank you to Husto and Anna, Iris and Karen, and to Brian, thank you so much. And if I may say that your students are a wonderful example of what you are achieving. So Henning, back to you. Uh, thank you, Derry. Also from my side, many thanks to our guests. Thank you for the brilliant moderation. And you are not only a moderator, you are a true entertainer, Derry. Thank you for that. <laughs> And special thanks to John, who is putting this topic on the table over and over again, and who has had the idea to invite Justo and Iris and the students from Nuestra Escuela. Thank you for that, John. This has been a special meeting because we had some guests. Usually we just meet and we talk about some topic among ourselves, but I think it was great to have some guests and maybe we can continue to invite guests.